Praise the Lord, IPC Hebron. Good morning. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says it is the blood of Jesus that washes us from all our iniquities or our sins. As we're looking at this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, I want you to come to the point where uh, we are now talking about the miracles of Jesus. Last time, Brother Joe started with the miracles of Jesus. If you remember, how many were there that's recorded in the Bible? There were 37 of them recorded in the Bible. And they were subdivided into four categories. It showed the power over nature, the power over the demonic, the resurrection power, as well as the healing power. And today we will talk about the first of those miracles, the power over nature, where Jesus created wine supernaturally without the natural processes. And we see that in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. So uh, as you're turning there, as a word of introduction, um, let me say the purpose of the Gospel of John, the only non-synoptic gospel, um, none of the other gospels mentions this miracle, but John establishes this miracle as the first miracle that Jesus did. Um, first, let me read John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. At the very end of John, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. 37 of them are recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe, and those who already believe that they may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you will have life in his name. So the miracles that are recorded in the word of God are for us, his disciples, to make us continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that we only have life through him. The blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary is the only way uh, for our redemption. So today's sermon title, Jesus' First Miracle, Wedding in Cana of Galilee. But it's not just a supernatural miracle that took place. There might be quite a bit of symbolism of the marriage supper of the Lamb that is yet to take place. So please keep that in mind as we study this portion. You first have to understand a few things about Jewish weddings. As it was tradition, there was a betrothal ceremony that took place where the bride and the groom with the family's involvement agreed to get married. And then the groom goes away. The groom goes back to his father's house and his job is to build a dwelling place for his bride. And uh, he goes back and that normally takes about a year. It could be more or less, but it could, it's about a year. And uh, the bride price uh, is prayed to the bride's father for the loss of their daughter. It's usually the groom's family or the groom's responsibility to pay the bride's price. And then after uh, uh, many months, um, it, is, it would be quite unannounced as to exactly the time. But with much fanfare, the, uh, we see that the groom along with his groomsmen are coming with great noise and celebration. And uh, he is coming to gather his bride. And uh, we see many stories in the Bible that talks about the different aspects of this. Um, we know about the 10 virgins uh, as they were not, five were prepared and five unprepared when the, when the groom was coming back for them. But after he comes back, there is a week long, uh, usually many days, typically a week-long celebration that takes place, a ceremony or a feast of a celebration in the Jewish tradition. And uh, that is what we'll learn about today in the wedding that took place in Cana of Galilee. So it foreshadows, as I said, the wedding supper of the Lamb, the ultimate union of joy, the great banquet in heaven that we're all eagerly waiting for. So let's go to John chapter 2, verse 1 through 12 the wedding at Cana. I know even the young kids here are very familiar with this. And see what stands out to you as I'm reading this. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus was also invited to the wedding along with his disciples. So we see a wedding taking place in a nearby town of Nazareth, uh, not only a few miles away. And both Jesus and disciples, uh, we see later his brother, sister, mom are all invited. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. We have a problem here. The wine, the old wine has ran out. The old wine has ran out. And the mother of Jesus went and said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And uh, in my study, I was seeing that this is the last actual word spoken by Mary. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you is what Mary says. Now to the servants. Uh, Now there were six stone jars, uh, water jars, that were for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. So easily 120 to 180 gallons, right? Uh, And that was used as water for purification to wash before uh, they would go in to worship or wash before a ceremony. And Jesus said to the servants, fill these jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, to the brim, not just halfway, but to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water had now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it of the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, as you're looking at this portion, you've learned it from young childhood on, you might have many things, many observations that stick out to you. Hopefully, this is not an excuse You know, I've heard a story where like somebody went to college and they said, I'm a Christian. No, I won't come to the party. I won't drink. And then they said, Jesus turned water into wine. But that's not what this is saying. Wine, oinos, in this Greek word, is not uh, necessarily alcoholic wine. And so uh, at that time, there was water uh, that was unpure and wine was added for the purposes of purifying the water and uh, we can have a different discussion on this another time. All of the negative effects, uh, medically as well, not just biblically, of touching alcohol. But hopefully that's not tripping you up. But what are some other things that stood out to you? It was the third day. There's even a band called Third Day. The third day is when the resurrection happened, right? Six stones of water jars, stone water jars that were used for the Jewish rites of purification. Maybe that stood out to you. Do whatever he tells you is what Mary, the mother of Jesus, who already knew about his divinity and his messiahship, said, just do it, just do what he says. And when Jesus says, women, what does this have to do with me? My hour had not come yet. You might think that Jesus was always thinking about the father's plan for him rather than his earthly plans at the time. Maybe Mary was saying, as the oldest son, can you find some wine? But Jesus was always thinking about the will of the father and the earthly will. Fill the brim to the very top. So there's no doubt there was not, uh, it was not anything but water. And uh, we'll see what the spiritual meaning of that is. You have kept the good wine until now. You have saved the best for last. So you'll see an old wine and you'll see a new wine. The old wine, what does that represent? And what does the new wine, which is Jesus and the blood of Jesus represent? And this was done to manifest his glory so that the disciples believed in him. Those are some observations that I had. Clearly, if you look at the science of this miracle, you could see that H. 2O, hydrogen and oxygen, was changed to sugar and carbohydrates 
And this was certainly something that is not en something that any of us could do, turn water into wine just by uh, not even speaking to it. It just happened, right? It shows the creator God with this authority over time, space, natural processes with ultimate power over the laws of the world. And so we can all agree that Jesus manifested his glory through this sign, as it says word for word in chapter 2, verse 11. He was able to transmutate this water into wine, and that showed his divinity over nature. He was able to change the color, the taste, the smell, and also the way it looked and felt uh, to the person uh, that is the master of the ceremonies. And he's saying, this is a very good wine, the best uh, that has been served in Israel. So we see that he's able to create wine out of water without going through the natural processes of planting a wine uh, um, and then waiting many years for it to produce grapes, being a husbandman and taking care of it and taking out the thorns and the thistles and taking care of it through the natural means, plucking the grapes and then having to press it down to produce grape juice and the processes of natural man, Jesus was able to overcome that without even speaking to it and it just happened because he desired it, right? Without touching or commanding it, we see that it was done. So there's no question that this showed the creative power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was there from the beginning of time. We know that he was there with the Father, uh, and he is the creator God. But also some other lessons that I was able to pick out um, that are practical. It says, Jesus must be invited to all of our events, and that will make all of the difference. See, the presence of Jesus in our different events will make all of the difference. When we come into a want, his presence was able to meet our every need. We see that Jesus was not hanging out with the people of fame and notoriety. He came down from heaven, right? But he was hanging out with the servants. That shows the humility of Jesus. Jesus cared for all, uh, even the ones that had insignificant needs. Even though initially he told his mother, what does this have to do with me? Uh, he was thinking more about the father's timing for him to come out as the Messiah. But when he saw the heartfelt need of that family, he was not saying that was in insignificant. We see the care of Jesus. And we see the love of Jesus as well as he came through in a pinch for them. Jesus also is a provider and he saves the best for last. And we see that in the practical way when we have a need if Jesus is invited to our party, if Jesus is invited into our life, he is able to guide us and make something that is joyful, that is a new wine, that is a source, and that will lead the people to triumph and not just produce a little wine, but many, many gallons, more than what we need, right? There's an abundance of joy, an abundance of grace that is produced. But also the important points that I'd like to stress in the next few minutes is Jesus will be the groom for the wedding supper of the Lamb. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Um, and we know that from all throughout the Bible. And, and as, we, as I quoted to start, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus is what washes us of all our iniquities and our sin. So it is Jesus uh, who is the one that washes us and does the transformation within our heart, right? He took the dirty bath water uh, that was used, used for purification and was able to change it into the best wine tasted by the master of the feast. Similarly, he's able to take us who are dirty and unworthy and become a joyful disciple. Uh, we can take the tasteless ones and make it so that we can gladden other people's hearts, right? Psalms 104 verse 15, as pastor always says, wine gladdens the heart of man and it also makes oil to make the face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. So Jesus is the one that needs to do the conversion or the transformation. I like to stay here for a second and say, many religions around the world will say, oh, you just have to be a good person. Jesus doesn't, is just another way to get to heaven. 
But this word of God clearly says that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to enter eternal life but by the blood of the Lamb. If you accept the Lord as your personal Savior and believe him with all your heart and are trusting in him for his second coming, then you have the right. And he is the one that has the ability to continue to transform us more and more into the likeness of Christ if we are trusting and abiding in the wine. But also, a uh, couple of steps of leaps that I like to take it also maybe has some symbolic meaning, a meaning of significance that Jesus came to establish the new covenant. These ceremonial washing pots represented the old covenant of the law. And we know that the people of Israel tried over and over and failed over and over. As we see in the book of Hebrews, uh, the old covenant, the blood of animals that was sacrificed yearly on the day of Yom Kippur, for the remission of sin uh, was not good enough. And there needed to be a new covenant. And that is based not upon our works, but by the grace and the love of the Lord. It's based on a love relationship uh, that is, uh, he gave his life for us and he paid our debts and he gave us the freedom from slavery um, of sin, shame, and death. So Jesus came to establish this new um, covenant of love and that is only achieved by believing in him and having the grace of the Lord flow through us. So true transformation cannot happen by the Old Testament law alone, but the Lord Jesus came to establish uh, and add on to, and say that it is not your works that save you, but it is the blood of the Lamb and it is the grace of the Lord. And Again, this is where I like to stand for the next few minutes for my remaining time. Jesus was thinking about his own wedding feast. The wedding imagery is used over and over in the Bible. You'll see it to symbolize the Messianic era. Uh, Matthew, Isaiah, Revelation, you'll see the wedding imagery that is used and was always in the mind of Jesus. He was always thinking about what the Father's will was for his life. And he had an unresolving desire to do the will of the Father and uh, make the kingdom of God happen, as we see in Matthew 22, 2. So Jesus provided this better wine that he is uh, able to uh, provide for us. And it is, I believe, a representation of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And as we take part in the Lord's table, we'll see that... Uh, the wine or the grape juice is a representation of the blood of the Lord Jesus, right? And so um, there is coming a day when he will come for his people that have their faith in the Lord Jesus. Um, and he will take his bride with him to glory. Are you part of the uh, ones? It is open to everyone, anyone and everyone who could believe in the Lord Jesus and live for him. So it is not an exclusive social club or anything like that, but he will be our reward. We will be satisfied and he was glorified and honored in us. So can we look at that in Revelation 19, 17, uh, seven to 10, it talks about the wedding feast of the lamb. We see apostle John sees this vision of the wedding supper of the lamb, the marriage supper that is about to take place and great praising among the multitudes, and the bride had made herself ready, it says. So let's go back to the Jewish tradition. There is a betrothal, as I said, on earth. Um, we and every other believer, any human being that puts their belief and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the savior of the world and decides to live according to his principles and love him and abide in him, he has the right to be part of this wedding supper of the Lamb. And that betrothal has already taken place. The bride's prize uh, has already been given because the father sent his only begotten son and he's already paid the price by the blood of Christ shed on the bride's behalf. The father God has already paid the price, the bride's ransom, the bride's prize, and he has already accomplish this. 
So before the rapture, anyone that has not accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and decide to live for him, now is the opportune time. If you're not part of this betrothal, now is the time to be part of this betrothal. The second step is the appearance of the bridegroom. Uh, we see that the groom will come, and he will come with his groomsmen, uh, as we said earlier, and uh, may come with a lot of noise. But that representation is a representation of the rapture, uh, where Christ will come at the trumpet sound, and we, he will come to claim his bride and take her to his father's house. His father's house is where he will take us. And so that is yet to take place. And the things all around the world are showing that that can happen today. That can happen the next moment. That can happen any time. Yeah, amen. The bridegroom appearance can happen any time. So if you're thinking you can live any way you want and are not in serious commitment in your betrothal to Christ, now is the time to come back because the bridegroom's appearance is at hand. The signs all around the world clearly show that. And then there is yet to be a marriage supper of the Lamb that will take place in heaven. That I was reading was between the rapture and the second coming uh, during the time of the tribulation on earth. The timing of that, I'm sure scholars could uh, argue about. But there is definitively a marriage supper of the Lamb. And only people that are invited are the ones that will be taken up at the rapture and the Old Testament saints that have died with him. And together we will have this marriage supper of the Lamb. This marriage supper of the Lamb is a glorious celebration of all who are in Christ. Revelation 19.9 says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb will leave all of his believers satisfied and he will be glorified and honored by the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so uh, the question is still, uh, are we part of the marriage supper? So are miracles just uh, there in the Bible? As you're studying the miracles over the next few weeks with us, I want you to think, yes, they are supernatural things that only God can do. And Jesus uh, was able to violate the natural order and do something supernatural. In reality, what he was really doing was restoring the order in the way that it should be. He had ordered nature rightly. Amen. Revelation 25, 21, verse 4 and 5 points us to a day when sickness and sorrow and sin will be no more, and death will be no more, because Jesus has made all things right. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and the bridegroom of Christ shall live with him forever and ever. Amen. So this is the blessed hope that we have. Yes, the turning water into wine was an amazing, amazing uh, miracle that showed the power of Jesus over nature but more than that it's symbolic of what is to come I wondered why wasn't it raising someone from the dead or some other miracle that might be considered greater but there was so much symbolism hidden in this uh, Cana of Galilee and the water turning into wine the old wine which ran out the old wine which was not able to provide uh, has now turned into new wine, which is only through the blood of Jesus. Not by any animal sacrifices, not by any other means, but only trusting in Jesus' name. As the worship team is coming up and my time, there's just a minute left, I'd like to end by saying uh, this lyric and just finishing up here. Jesus is the greatest change agent. Jesus was pierced and water and blood came out of his side. That wine represents the blood of Jesus that, is going to, that we're all going to take part in. Uh, those who are born again and living a life waiting for his coming in the Lord's table. Joy, hope, and a future wedding of the Lamb is what we have to look forward to. So my hope is built on nothing less but on Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Amen. His hope, his covenant, his blood 
supports me in the whelming flood. When we're going through difficulties in this life, when we're in need, yes, he's able to provide the supernatural when he desires. But more than that, all things will be made right on that day uh, when he comes back for us and we will be spending eternity with him forever and ever. And as part of that, we'll have the wedding supper of the Lamb where the church will be married to the groom, Jesus, and live with him forever and ever. So on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with the trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, because all other ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less but on Jesus' blood and righteousness. As I started, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it is the blood of Jesus that is able to wash us from our sins. Do not rely on yourself. Do not rely on your good works. Do not rely on the misguidement of others that says that, oh, Jesus turned water into wine that you can imbibe. But no, the, this was just a symbolism of what is to come. So the next time someone tells you that, you have an answer to give. Yes, Jesus turned water into wine because I am going to be with him forever and ever. He is a new wine and I will be separated from the world and I will wait for his rapture and I will live for him as a bride of Christ and eventually I will live with him forever and ever and that is my goal. May God bless you all with these words.